make sure that's working. Looks like it's working. Let me just make sure I'm presenting to this screen. I am. Okay. So 4.1, in what ways did cross-cultural interactions result in the diffusion of technology and facilitate changes in patterns of trade and travel in the time period we're looking at, 1450 to 1750? Um, to address that first part, the diffusion of several pieces of technology from outside Europe were essential to Europe being able to start to engage in global exploration and these oceanic voyages. We discussed this diffusion previously as part of Unit 2 when we read the article by Dr. Linda Schaefer called Southernization. If you remember reading that article and doing the quiz and like the, uh, the worksheet and stuff that goes along with it, remember that Dr. Schaefer's thesis was basically that the progress, discovery, inventions, and so on of South Asia, of, of India, what she called southernization, right, the spread of this knowledge and technology out of South Asia, paved the way for the westernization of the 15 and 16, 1700s that we're looking at. These technologies all made their way into Europe in various ways and at various times, but from different places, right? They were not natively developed in Europe. It was through Europe's interactions with these other places that they're able to gain this technology. One of the places that we're gonna see if you watch the extra credit documentary um, is that just that, just geography, just being located next to other people that invented this stuff was a big advantage for Europeans that some groups like Native Americans didn't have, right? They were not next to the people that invented steel. They weren't living next to the people that invented, you know, geometry or whatever, right? They weren't living next to people that invented written languages or you name it, gunpowder or whatever, right? None of those things were invented in Europe. All of them made their way over there over time from one group or another, all right? So we talked about the Chinese compass. If you remember before, we said this is invented in China around 200 BC. They use it for magic, for fortune telling originally. Um, but eventually, you know, begin to navigate with it and, and figure out the things you can actually use a compass for. And it ends up in Europe in the 1100s around at some time when they think that it first starts getting used there in the 12th century. All right. But is transferred from the Chinese to the Arabs to Europeans. The astrolabe we talked about is actually originally a Greek invention, right? Like the ancient Greeks invent the astrolabe. Um, but it's not, you know, widely used throughout the rest of Europe when the Greek civilization kind of peters out a little bit. Um, a lot of astrolabes aren't really made and the people that adopt or kind of like take care of a lot of Greek knowledge outside of Europe, the Arabs are the people that begin to use the astrolabe a lot and make all these improvements to it. Um, before again, it ends up back in Europe being sort of widely used by the 12th century through actually um, Spain, through Muslim Spain. Um, the astrolabe's kind of reintroduced to Europe. And remember that you use an astrolabe to, uh, well, this guy's kind of using an astrolabe in the image here, right? To kind of plot your location north or south of the equator based on um, the locations of stars and things like that. Latin sails. Or again, something that are developed by the Arabs, probably invented earlier by some other group, but um, the Arabs are the ones that popularize them. These are those triangular sails that let you kind of sail your boat against the wind, the Latin sails. Um, likewise, around this period of time, you start to see them pop up on a lot of European ships. Gunpowder, we talked about last time as part of 3.1 and like gunpowder empires, um, as well as we've read about it a bunch throughout our chapters here, was invented in the ninth century, if you remember, in the 800s in China, used for, again, kind of for magic, right, for alchemy to help you like live longer, doesn't end up being able to do that, but it ends up being this effective weapon, right? Um, the Mongols get a hold of it and they spread it throughout a lot of places. It makes its way over to Europe. We talked about that before. And the last thing on there, I included the things like monsoon knowledge, right? One of the pieces of technology or knowledge that diffuses, that's going to facilitate 
European exploration and, and the things that we're looking at for 4.1, um, trade and travel and all that, was knowledge of the monsoon winds, which we said, again, is first pioneered kind of by the Malaysian sailors of the Indian Ocean area, but is spread to you know everybody else that kind of enters into that area. But when Europeans first arrive there, they don't have any knowledge of the monsoon winds, right? And they have to learn from people around there and hire local guides, I guess, to the Indian Ocean that can pass this knowledge on to them, all right? But it's something they have to sort of relearn for themselves when they enter into that area. Um, last here, the start of the era known as the Renaissance and the reconnection of medieval Europeans to their Roman and Greek past helped spark an era in Europe known for experimentation and rebellion against traditions. European minds became more involved in mathematics and scientific pursuits and their discoveries as well. And some sailors of the Italian world of the Renaissance would aid in European exploration as well. A lot of the most famous sailors that we're going to kind of look at as part of this lecture we're Italian and we're coming out of that world of the Renaissance and the improved techniques and methods and technologies that were being kind of pioneered or redeveloped in Renaissance Italy. Um, new ship designs were pioneered by Europeans during this, you know, age of exploration, as it's sometimes called, that allowed them to venture into more dangerous waters, right? Most of the ships used in Europe before 1450 are all ships called barges. And a barge could be a very big boat, but they they weren't really used for much else besides coastal travel, right? They were not designed to sort of go out into the deep waters of the ocean. They're meant to stay pretty close to shore, pretty close to safe harbors, and not have to deal with the big waves and storms of the open sea. These new ship designs were much better at, you know, deep blue ocean kind of sailing. So the... Two or three that you really need to know and have on your notes, where you're gonna, where you might see some question, you know, about like the design of a particular boat are the caravel and the carac, and one more I'm gonna have you add on there the flute, f l u y t. All right, the caravel was the smallest of these ships we'll talk about here, and it's first developed by the Portuguese around 1450. The caravel. It's about 75 feet long, or it was, you know, we don't use a ton of them anymore, with Latin sails on two or three masts, right? Like you can kind of see here, this is sort of like a caravel. Um, or I think this is actually supposed to look a little bit like a dow, but two or three masts with triangular sails that are made to sort of catch the wind. It would also have a stern rudder, right? A rudder on the back of the ship. So it's a ship design that was smaller, lighter, faster, was able to travel out deep into the ocean and integrated these several technologies kind of passed over from the Arab world or you know even from China, although people in Europe might not have sort of been aware that's where this stuff came from, right? Um, so that's the caravel. Columbus's ships, for example, and a lot of the ships that are doing the voyages we're gonna be talking about here were caravels, all right? Real small ships, um, especially when you can compare them to the ships of Zheng He or people like that. The Karak, or Karak, was a larger ship, like twice the size, about 150 feet in length, with, they used both Latin sails, the triangular sails, and big sort of square sails, like you're used to seeing on, you know, whatever we think of as kind of pirate ships or, or big sailboats or something, to kind of combine both of those, right? A square sail has a lot more surface area, you catch a lot more wind, lets you go faster, have mixing in the triangular sails, lets you kind of catch wind at different angles, and you know, have the advantages of that, be able to sail into the wind and stuff. The Karak combines both those sails. And they're sometimes combined on the Caravel as well. Um, the Karak is a lot more used for trade, right? The Caravel could be used for trade, but was, you know, sort of like a four long distance voyages for exploration or making these long trips quickly. Um, the Karak is a trade boat. It's a big boat for trade, right? Once you know where you're going, you use a Karak instead of a Caravel. The last one was the flute. A flute is a lot like a Karak in as far as like how it's designed, right? Several masts with square sails and triangular sails, um, a stern boast rudder, but it was designed by the Dutch and it was a little bit smaller. It's about 80 feet long, all right? Um, but those three are like 
you know, things we definitely need to know, right? You got to have those ship designs. The other thing that is really being improved upon are star charts, right? St charts of the night sky, which is how these sailors navigated the oceans, right? No GPS or anything like that. They have to use instruments like the astrolabe combined with their compass and a bunch of other tools we didn't mention, like a cross staff or sextant or these other things, right, um, to navigate the ocean using the locations of certain stars and their distance from the horizon and things like that. Star charts help them be able to kind of make sense of that information and figure out where they are. Um, they go all the way back, the use of star charts to, you know, Babylon and you know, other Mesopotamian civilizations 2000 BC or, or earlier. The Chinese are for sure using them in the fifth century. These really developed star charts, but again, they start using them for other purposes than navigation, um, but are using them to navigate the oceans. The big change in Europe is that starting around 1609, because this period of exploration isn't just Columbus, right? It's going on for more than a century, okay? And involves all these scientific discoveries that are, that are happening during this time. In 1609, the telescope, is sort of first developed in Europe, building on earlier technologies like the lens and stuff like that. But the first telescopes are used in Europe in the early 1600s. And guys like Galileo, for example, are gonna use these telescopes to improve astronomical knowledge, right? Of where the stars are and so on, and make better maps because of that, right? So part of this is improved star charts. Part of it is also just better maps as well, better better map making methods and tools that are used. And I included on here some examples of some of these old maps, right? And I don't want to say too much about them because it's, it's better if we have a couple days to kind of go over this lecture. I want to try and get it all done in our session here. But look at this map. These are two different maps, but they're, they're similarly uh, oriented or whatever, right? This is a map of the world from around 630 CE in the top left from a Spanish archbishop. Notice that, um, you know, this is not very detailed, right? It is oriented to the east, okay? It points up towards, in this case, where Jerusalem would have been for Western Europeans. And it splits the world into these kind of three sections, all right, um, separated by the oceans, okay? But it's not a super, you know, detailed or accurate looking map, but but that's technically one of the earlier maps that we have of the ancient world, all right? Um, you see a more detailed version of this in the um, bottom right, Um where there's a lot of like biblical stuff kind of mixed in on there. Um, the, you know, what can you see on here? Um, things like, I'm trying to see where some of these things are. Uh, well, I'm, they're not popping out to me right now, but there are things on there about like, um, children of Noah and things like that. On a lot of these maps, you will see, it's on here somewhere. I just can't quite find it right now. There are, um, you know, this is where the, the uh, Noah's Ark is supposed to be, biblical references and things like that. But these are pretty crude looking maps, right? This is a map um, from a Sicilian that copied sort of an, an or hired an Arab, uh, cartographer, this guy Al Idrisi, to produce this atlas of the earth. This is a map of Europe and North Africa, only in this case, south is on the top. All right, so if you kind of look around at this map and know that south is on the top instead of north is on the top. North being on the top is something, you know, that's been developed relatively recently. It's not always the case. The word orient means like to the east, right? In the direction of Jerusalem. Most maps were oriented to the east, like you saw before. The Arabs represented south on the top, right? And you kind of really make a map however you want. Um, but notice, this is like the Arabian Peninsula here, right? Where Yemen and stuff, Saudi Arabia, where all that stuff would be right here. Um, if you, some stuff you might recognize is like, this is Italy over here. If you see like the Italian boot, only it's upside down, the island of Sicily, 
Um, this would be like Greece and stuff like that. Um, this is Spain and uh, Portugal sticking out over here, right? Um, and this is, you know, this whole thing is Europe. This is the Middle East. This is parts of China and so on. This is North Africa. Um, oriented a little bit different, but that is a, a map of the world produced by Arabs in the, um, you know, 1200s or so, um, the 1100s, I guess, the 12th century. This is a map from the 1300s where in this case, the center is Jerusalem. It's, you know, oriented, uh, like centered on the Orient, on Jerusalem. Um, and this map is using rum lines, right? It's having these lines of compass directions that extend out from that center spot, right? But a more detailed map, it looks a lot like that Arab one I showed you a second ago. And then this is one from a Venetian monk, Frau Moro. You don't need to know any of that stuff. Um, that um, looks at some of the, or excuse me, the, uh, an Italian guy um, that kind of begins some of the first maps that have America written on them, right? But you can see that in this case, um, it's not the continents that we sort of know, right? Because they hadn't all been explored. Um, it's a bunch of islands for them. And th you can see right here, this is supposed to be Japan, which they thought was sort of right on the other side. This kind of shows the early sort of, I guess we'll say lack of knowledge that these people had about the world, right? Um, you can't really see everything here and things aren't where they're supposed to be because they hadn't explored all of these continents and they didn't know exactly what was on the other side, right? They did know that if you went far enough west, you would get to Asia. But in this case, these people were imagining that it was just right on the other side of South America or, or North America, um, which they also thought were not, you know, these giant continents, but were smaller islands. Um, they would find out that they were, you know, wrong and pretty far away from, um, from Asia. All right, so moving on, looking at a couple other things for this. Motivations for exploration. Um, motivations for exploration are often summarized as God, gold, and glory by historians. Um, associating these examples I'm gonna give you with those three Gs, right? Trying to like figure out which would go with which, which would go in which bucket of God, gold, or glory is a good way to kind of remember these, okay? The first kind of motivation for people to leave Europe and start exploring um, is demographic pressure, is population pressure. That as European population sort of grew in the century after the Black Death, the pressure this placed on regions of Europe was immense and not all workers in Europe were able to find work or even food. For many, the possibility of settlement in a new land was very enticing and even the sort of normally very dangerous work of sailing had this greater appeal to the crowded, impoverished masses of some of Europe's recovering urban centers. So we're not just talking about 1492. Again, we're talking about this whole era of colonization and exploration into the 1700s, right? We have population pressures in Ireland or in Spain or in these different places that are pushing people to leave their sort of home country and go settle in these colonies that are being established in other parts of the world. So population pressure is, is one of the first ones. The other one is a medieval tradition or law known as primogeniture, all right? Uh, which I think we've mentioned before, but I don't, I don't quite remember. Primogeniture is a tradition um, that motivated many young men to go exploring. Um, primogeniture laws gave all of a family's estate, right? All of the land that they held was inherited by the firstborn son, all right? So if you're, you know, the firstborn child, you were gonna get everything under these inheritance laws, right? Your brothers and sisters would inherit nothing. This kept the family fortune intact, right? If you divided your land among three or four sons, none of them were gonna be as rich as their father was, right? None of them were gonna command as much wealth and territory and power if you divided the land like the old Germanic tribes did or something every time you passed it on to your children. So the primogeniture said, it's all gonna go to the firstborn son, the other kids gotta kind of figure it out, right? They've gotta make a name for themselves, swear their loyalty to some other king or nobleman and get land from them. 
but the firstborn son is going to be taken care of. Everybody else, sort of good luck. Well, if you weren't that firstborn son, these laws were, again, sort of a good reason for young European men to go out to try to maintain the status that they had known, right? And that, that kind of way of life or make a new name for themselves on their own. Primogeniture is often cited as a reason for European men to go on crusades as well, right? The same kind of reasons. This possibility of adventure and glory sort of for your own name, all right? Religious intolerance as a push factor for people leaving. Um, there were a lot of persecutions and religious wars of the 16th and 17th century in Europe. Um, if you watch the 3.3 the lectures, the Protestant Reformation one, then you saw me kind of cover those religious wars. Hopefully you're familiar with that, what I'm talking about. Um, but those, you know, wars, this period of persecution where, you know, millions of people are dying in some of these wars, like the, the 30 years war, things like that, that I mentioned, um, or these wars are going on for decades at a time. Again, the 30 years war in the Holy Roman Empire, there's a 30 year long, like kind of religious war in France um, between Protestants and, and Catholics. There is fighting between the Spanish and the British is a part of this. Like, there's a lot of like major conflicts going on during this time. This was a big reason for people to get out of Europe as well. Some of the American stories we have about the early settlers of America were people trying to, you know, we'll say escape religious persecution. Um, so the Protestant Reformation that began with Martin Luther in 1517 would lead to the birth of many new denominations of Christianity and subsequently the persecution of those new groups by the Catholic Church or even sometimes by other Protestant groups, such as the Anabaptists, if you remember them from the other lecture. This map, um, oh, I thought I had another map up here. I don't have another map up here. That's fine. Um, uh, I thought I had a map up here that showed <laughs> the Puritans traveling to America. Um, the Puritans or the Pilgrims, we'll sometimes call them, were English Calvinists, again, if you remember talking about Calvinists in the other lecture, um, that thought the Anglican Church, the Church of England, the Protestant Church created by Henry VIII, had kept too many traditions from the Catholic Church, and they wanted even greater reform in the English Church, um, and were, you know, kind of looked at as sort of an annoyance by English Protestants, and also, you know, obviously by English Catholics that still remained, and were persecuted from both English Protestants and English Catholics. And they left in large groups to the Americas as a place of refuge from persecution. There's a lot of Protestant groups that are doing things like that, right? Quakers or, or whoever, whoever you want to talk about that are making their way over to the Americas and bringing those religious traditions with them. Even the descendants of some of the Anabaptists, one of the largest denominations in the United States today is Baptist, right? Southern Baptist, right? And that comes right out of the Anabaptist tradition. Um, so the Americas were a place of refuge, right? And religious persecution and the intolerance in Europe was one of the motivations for people to come to the Americas. Keep in mind, that doesn't mean that those people were religiously tolerant, right? The Puritans, came here for religious freedom, but for the freedom for them to practice their religion the way they wanted to, not for anybody to be able to practice the religion they wanted to, right? Those same people were setting people on fire for witchcraft, right? For doing things that didn't look like their religion. So they're not religious freedom advocates for anybody but sort of themselves in their community, right? Um, another good example of this persecution, this religious fervor that's going on, is that in 1492, this famous year of exploration, all the Jews in Spain were kicked out when that country is sort of reunified and the last Muslim kingdom was defeated by Spain's armies. One of the first things the king and queen do is make laws to kick out all the Jews and Muslims for that matter. And anybody that refused to um, had, was forced to convert to Christianity or was killed, right? Were killed as heathens, as heretics. Um, so, you know, it's not, you know, unique to one group. Missionaries. 
Missionaries also played a major role in the motivations for exploration. Most ships of this era kept a clergyman, a priest or something like that, on board to minister to the crew, but also to try and convert the non-Christians encountered on some of the voyages we're going to talk about. Some of those missionaries were from the new denominations of the Protestant Reformation. But more often than not, missionaries found in most parts of the world out of outside of Europe were Catholics. A lot of the times from the Society of Jesus, your book talks about a little bit, um, that or they're called the Jesuits sometimes, that were formed as a response to the Reformation known as the Counter-Reformation. I don't mention it in the lecture or notes, but your book talks about it a little bit in chapter 15, though, I think. So we'll come back to that a little bit later and talk about the Counter-Reformation. Again, I'm trying not to give you too much, so I don't want to post, you know, five videos for you to watch. So I'm trying to break them up, even if it means that we got to kind of spread some of this information out over a couple modules. All right. I'm doing it so that you don't have too much work. Um, but the goal of these Jesuits that kind of come out of this counter reformation or this Catholic reformation was in part to reconvert Europeans that had left and to gather new Christians into the Catholic church as well from these new places being explored by Europeans, whether that was Africa or Asia, or obviously in the Americas. And then the last kind of major motivation for exploration was competition over trade routes. Following the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453 and the expansion of that empire, that again, we've talked about in earlier lectures, the trade routes that brought luxury goods like silk or spices, porcelain, stuff like that, to Europe from the East, South, and Southeast Asia were dominated by the Ottomans. So trade continued, but Europe's trade with the Ottomans was itself sort of monopolized by a few people, by the Venetians and by the Genoans, right? Again, these Italian merchant cities where the Renaissance was happening, but they were also super rich from conducting this Mediterranean trade, right? They monopolized European trade with the Ottoman Empire. Beyond that, beyond having to sort of get it from these people that monopolized the trade and could kind of mark the price up, we talked about this before, that all the goods moving along the Silk Road or along some of these routes, it's not like one trip from the Spice Islands, which you see over here, sort of South and Southeast Asia. It's not like there's one guy loading those spices onto a boat and taking it to a port in the Ottoman Empire. It's going to a bunch of different ports and changing a bunch of different merchant hands and each merchant's marking the price up a little bit, right? There's a lot of middlemen all trying to turn a profit in between. So Europeans had a couple of motivations, right? They want to cut out this middleman, um, both the Venetians and Genoans, but also the Ottomans, who they were frequently at war with, but also in this situation where they were the only people they could get some of these th things they wanted from because they didn't know how to get there themselves, right? Um the result was very high prices for Europeans being sold to them by, you know, from their perspective, these heathen infidels, you know, of the Ottoman Empire um, that they were frequently fighting with. The desire to find a direct route to the sources of those spices, silks, other things was more valuable than ever. So a prime motivation for this is to cut out all those uh, middlemen in the Arab, Indian or Central Asian world. Um, and to make European merchants, you know, rich by getting directly to that source themselves. Okay, anything uh, as far as that goes? Any questions so far? You keeping up, following along with me? Kind of get into some of the details of these journeys here in a second, but I don't see any questions or anything. Again, don't know. If I'm all alone or not. Um, all right, 4.1 to conclude here. There's other things that are going on that we should that we should mention as well. Um, this is a period of rapid expansion and exploration of global global trade. That's not just being carried out by Europeans, right? But other places are expanding and exploring as well. The Polynesians, the people that are going to settle the islands of the Pacific, are doing so kind of really in the era right before this, in the middle of the 1200s and even kind of earlier before that. But they deserve some mention in this in this time where we're talking about um, stuff right here. Do you need your laptop? Here. 
Um, if you think about again, like I hate to use the comparison, but maybe like Moana or something, right? These are the people that we're talking about, Polynesians, right? The people that are gonna settle places from Fiji to New Zealand all the way to Hawaii or Easter Island, right? The the whole area of the Pacific is settled by these groups of people that are kind of descended from the Malaysian sailors of the Indian Ocean. Um this settlement, this exploration and settlement takes centuries and is done through this kind of skillful navigation of Polynesian sailors leaving from ports in places like Fiji around 400 CE or so to the uh, Marquesas Islands over here by the 1200s to Easter Island, which you can see is pretty close to the coasts of South America. Um, I have an article that we're not reading this week, but there's been a lot of research on if uh, these Polynesians were maybe some of the first people to reach the Americas from outside of the Americas um, from the East rather than from, or excuse me, from the West rather than from the East. Um, there's evidence like, you know, for example, sweet potatoes or um, chickens that you can find in South America that are native to these other lands, you know, that Polynesians had been to. Um, the chicken being a big one, how to get there. I think Polynesian sailors probably met up with some Native Americans at some point and transferred some of that stuff. Um, let's see, Hawaii is settled as early as the fifth century and then more extensive and sort of intentionally planned colonization missions by these Polynesian sailors settled New Zealand around 1200 and return to Hawaii and Easter Island with more people to establish kind of permanent settlements by around 1200 as well. Um, another thing that's going on at this time that we've talked about a little bit before is the, the growth of Islam through trade that is going on before this era and continuing throughout this era in places like Southeast Asia, East Asia, East Africa. All those places are becoming more Muslim, more Islamic, not through conquest or anything like that, but through trade relationships with Arab or Muslim merchants. Um, likewise, a similar change is happening in West Africa, although it's not connected to the Indian Ocean. West Africa is becoming more Islamized or Muslim during this time due to increasing trade relationships with the Islamic world. By the end of this era, Europe will see also the development of Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, France, and Holland into maritime empires, the kind of focus of the rest of this unit. Um, 